Well, welcome everyone. Um, let's go ahead and get started. Um, as Dr. Swanson said, we are actually audio and video recording this, so um, Dr. Majula and I will be speaking into the microphone uh, for the purposes of our conversation. Before we get started, uh, I am Wendy Bostwick. I'm an associate professor in the Public Health and Health Education Program here at NIU. My research actually is focused on health disparities, uh, but among LGBT populations with a particular focus on bisexual women. Uh, the purpose of today's seminar really is to make explicit some of the tacit practices that undergird the scholarly and um, research inquiry process. And in particular, to highlight how we do interdisciplinarity and how um, we can employ multi-method inquiry in the work that we do, while also acknowledging the challenges the benefits, the barriers, and the costs associated with such work. We'll be talking about Dr. Majola's uh, research as it relates to her book, uh, Love, Money, and HIV, Becoming a Modern African Woman in the Age of AIDS, which you can tell I've been looking at recently. <laughs> This work, if you don't know, is focused on the disproportionately high rate of HIV among young Kenyan women. Dr. Majula's research relies on biomedical, behavioral, social, economic, and ecological perspectives to tell the rich and complex story of how gender, sexuality, and health intersect to fuel the AIDS epidemic among this group of women. So here's Dr. Majula. She received her PhD from the University of Chicago in 2008 in sociology, yes, and is currently an associate professor of sociology at the University of Colorado at Boulder. Presently, however, she is on sabbatical. Yay, sabbatical! <laughs> at the W.E.B. Du Bois Research Institute at the Hutchins Center at Harvard University. Her research examines the social and structural processes underlying health disparities in a variety of settings, including Kenya, South Africa, and most recently and most currently Washington, DC. Her current work uses mixed methods to examine gender disparities in HIV rates, as I discussed, and the HIV epidemic among African Americans in Washington, DC. Her methodological specialty is combining qualitative methods which we'll talk about in a little bit more depth, with quantitative methods to answer research questions. Her work utilizes focus groups, interviews, and survey data, while framing her finding using lenses not just um, from sociology and of sociology, but also public health and epidemiology, culture and gender studies, and the larger historical, political, and economic context of Kenya and the larger African continent. So, with that, um, I'd like to jump in. I'm going to start with some questions for Dr. Majola. My understanding is that you all are here uh, not necessarily till the end of our time. Is that correct? Sure, because I sprung the time. Okay. Uh, we didn't really discuss. I know some people do have other uh, class texts and then get four forty-five. Okay. So, with the understanding that some of you will have to leave earlier on, I want to ensure that there is a larger dialogue so that you all have the ability to ask questions um, before you take off if you need to leave early. But I'm just going to get the ball rolling. Sure. So, mm -hmm. let's start at the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, and I only say that partially facetiously. I'm curious to know for you how you came to the work that you're currently doing and what first drew you to this and interested you in the current topic that you're working on. Great. Well, thanks for that introduction. I'm really uh, excited to be here um, with all of you. Um, so uh, I took in my second year of undergrad. I did my undergrad in England. I took a class on the sociology of health and illness. And the professor made the claim that people don't get sick by accident, that it's not random that in fact you could predict who was going to get sick, who was going to live longer, who was going to die earlier, based on things like gender, race, ethnicity, where people lived, how much education they had. And this was really shocking to me, because I used to think you know, the flu is random, right? Uh, who gets particular diseases is random, but there's actually a social pattern um, in, in who gets sick and who doesn't. 
Um, and so coming from the African continent, which had been ravaged by HIV AIDS, um, I thought, well, if we know, if we can predict who's going to get sick, and if there's social reasons why people get sick, then there's social ways in which we can prevent it. Um, and so fast forward a few years in grad school, uh, I came across a paper that said, you know, why do young women have higher rates of HIV compared to young men? Uh, and the ra HIV rates in the paper were astounding. Um, they found that 30% of young women aged 15 to 19 um, and almost 40% uh, of young women aged 20 to 24 um, in a town called Kisumu were HIV positive. Um, and this was a representative household-based survey. So it was a sort of a really well done survey. And I found these numbers very hard to believe because they were so high. Um, and they were five to six times higher than young men uh, of the same age. So I, f I started thinking, you know, is this just unique to this place or is it true in other parts of Africa? So that's when I started looking at other countries, looking at survey data and found that actually in every country for which I could find data, young women had higher rates of HIV compared to young men. Uh, and so that's what made me decide to investigate how, uh, why young women were at such high risk mm -hmm. um, for HIV. Yeah. Great, thank you. And so can you talk a little bit more then about what it meant to be trained as a sociologist yeah. and how sociologists typically go about answering questions? So uh, I, was, I was trained as a demographer. So, so that's somebody who does population studies. Um, and so I started with numbers scary numbers, right? So I had to, I started off uh, learning statistics and taking a lot of courses on statistics. Um, and I did a lot of survey analysis. And so my initial thought was how I was going to figure out what was going on was by simply doing survey analysis. So as I explained, I looked at all the surveys for which I could find data. Um, and, and so yes, young women had higher rates of HIV compared to young men. But when I started digging deeper, into the data, uh, I, I found that the, all the things that I thought were important were not straightforward. So for example, it turned out that when I looked at education, right, because most in the most cases, people who are more educated have lower rates of disease, right? And this is one, one way of predicting who lives longer than who, even in the US, uh, who, who is less, less likely to get particular kinds of illnesses, Education is a really good predictor. But when it comes to HIV AIDS in the African context, it's actually reversed. And so in fact, women with the lowest uh, education uh, had the lowest rates of HIV, right? But then it was nonlinear. So uh, as you moved up with more education, some women had high rates, some women had low rates. Um, and the same thing with wealth the wealthiest people in Africa have the highest rates of HIV. So again, usually it's the, the reverse. <laughs> uh, and so there were all these puzzles in the mm -hmm. quantitative data that made me want to actually just you know, go and figure out what are the mechanisms, social mechanisms producing these trends? What is actually going on underneath the numbers in these communities that are making things like education so, uh, so confounding? Um, yeah. So it's, it sounds like then that you sort of started on the quant side, right? Yes. You were more quantitatively oriented, quantitatively trained. Yeah. And so what was that moment yeah. when you were like, oh, I think I need to expand yeah. the way that I'm asking this question. And was that scary for you? <laughs> yes, it, 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 it was very scary because I had already um, formed a dissertation committee. Oh, wow. And most okay. of my committee members were demographers. Um, and I had been proposing a quantitative analysis, but all the preliminary analysis I was doing, I found nothing significant. So I found myself going round and round in circles, just trying to figure out the relationship between education and HIV. Um, and so I thought maybe there was a problem with the data. Mm -hmm. and so I went to the field in uh, Nyanza province, and I went to the different district offices thinking I could get district level data, um, but I was, also there um, uh, somewhat frustrated because the data was not disaggregated by age. Okay. So uh, in, in the settings that I studied, they were not aware that young women were at higher risk 
for HIV because the, the data they had didn't divide things up by age. Um, and so uh, it was partly those frustrations that led me to think, why don't I do qualitative analysis um, and match it with national demographic and health survey data from, from this area? Um, and then go back and forth between the national data that existed mm -hmm. and the qualitative data to try and figure out what was going on. Yeah. And so <laughs> I, I'm curious mm -hmm. if you experienced any barriers mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. or challenges, um, either specifically from your committee or in a, in a mm -hmm. larger sense, mm -hmm. when you came to that aha moment of, the best way for me to answer this question yeah. is to do yeah. more mixed method work. I, I'm, I'm curious what that process looked like for you. Yeah. It, was, it was very difficult. Okay. Uh, it was a very difficult uh, process. Um, because I think, especially when you, you've taken several years being trained in a particular methodology, you want to find a research problem that matches <laughs> with that method. And it's very frustrating when you have a question that you can't answer. Mm -hmm with a particular method. But, but, but part of this and, and, and part of what I hope um, you, know, you all take away is, is it's good when you let the question drive the method as opposed to the method driving the question. So, uh, and, and, and so it was hard to, you know, I think, convince my committee. Mm -hmm. But in the end, I think they, they, they sort of had confidence that I was, able to I was going to be able to come up with a good dissertation. Mm -hmm. And so they let me sort of go off and and do my field work, I acquired an anthropologist on my committee. You acquired an anthropologist, okay, very good. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I basically, so I didn't, I wasn't formally trained in ethnographic field work. Um, I, other than I think I audited half a course mm -hmm. and I got all the required textbooks mm -hmm. and then I basically learned as I went okay. um, by immersion in the field and then um, my anthropology uh, uh, mentor would give me advice. She'd look over my field notes, um, and 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 I'd also do a lot of um, uh, asking of of, of different, uh, uh, especially when I got to Kenya. Mm -hmm. as, you know, I met with a lot of professors there to ask for their advice uh, on how to, you know, the kinds of questions that were appropriate to ask, some of the ethical issues uh, that were relevant to the setting, and so on that really helped me in crafting a, a project that would, that would work, yeah. Um, yeah, that raises, that, that makes me want to ask about 17 more questions, actually. Um, but I, I'm curious if you can expand, in, in particular, you know, this notion of field work. Mm -hmm. So it, it sounds like even before you um, made the decision to leap into uh, mixed method methodology, pardon me, um, that you were already traveling to Kenya, mm -hmm. that you had already done some of the groundwork uh, just for the quantitative mm -hmm. part of your inquiry. At what point were you at that you decided you, need to go, you needed to go back to do that more ethnographically oriented field work? Mm -hmm. So I, I, I was somewhat unconventional in the sense that I began my field work and then proposed halfway through. Okay. Um, and so I'd already started, if I recall correctly, doing the survey work mm -hmm. um, ahead of time and reached that frustration point. Okay. Um, and, and I happened, and then I, I, I went home to Kenya, started doing preliminary meetings with um, different uh, professors and, um, uh, uh, and uh, uh, policy people in the field. Uh, and then came back, wrote my proposal, and then returned back to the field. Okay. So okay. the process actually, I'd already started doing initial interviews and, in, and initial data analysis before okay. I, I, I did my proposal. Got it. Yeah. Interesting. So for people around the table that maybe aren't as familiar, mm -hmm. uh, and for people in the future watching this video, <laughs> who may not be <laughs> as familiar with some of the methods mm -hmm. uh, in, a qu in qualitative methodologies, can you talk a little bit about the methods that you did use and the relative pros and cons mm -hmm. of, of those methods, particularly the, the qualitative methods? Yeah. So I, I used a variety of methods um, in, in, uh, in my research. The first one was interviewing uh, what are called key informants. Uh, and so these are sort of a way of acknowledging that there are a lot of experts 
in the who who are already in in an area that you're interested in. Uh, and so I began my work by interviewing these key informants, so people like community leaders, um, district officials, um, uh, researchers in the area, people who worked for non-governmental organizations or NGOs, um, to ask them why they thought HIV was really high, both in the, in the community, in the part of Kenya I was studying, uh, as well as among young women in particular. Um, and in one case, I also had already drafted some potential questions I was going to ask, so an interview schedule. Um, and I shared that with, with key informants to ask, if, is there something I'm missing? Are uh, there questions I need to ask or better ways of asking questions? And even things like uh, compensation, mm -hmm. right? So should I pay my respondents when I do interviews? Again, acknowledging the norms in the US are different. Uh, from, from norms in other parts of the world. And so key informant interviews are a really great way to begin um, field work. Um, the other method I used was participant observation. Um, and this, this particular method involves uh, exactly what it says, both participating in everyday life, uh, on the setting that I'm um, studying in, but also observing. So a lot of time spent in especially new communities is observing ways of life. because Sometimes what people say and what people do are aligned, but a lot of times what people say and what people do are not aligned, right? So we often don't really know what we're doing. <laughs> we, we, we have thoughts about what we're doing, but we, we are not always, uh, the, the two don't always match. Um, then I also did um, individual interviews. So I interviewed young women, I interviewed young men, I interviewed middle-aged men and women. I interviewed older men and women um, in addition to the key informant interviews. Um, and then I also did focus group interviews. So these are interviews that involve groups of six to eight people. Um, and, and these are really great uh, getting at norms. So um, things that are considered common sense in a, in a particular community uh, or things that uh, uh, or getting a sense of the culture of a place. Um, you know, th so it's great because you can sort of introduce something or ask a question, and then someone will make a comment, and then everyone will either agree or disagree or laugh or comment or, or joke. And so you have a sense of what people really think, you know, about that issue. You know, so for example, someone would talk about, uh, you know, I would ask, you know, so, uh, you know, is it okay to have boyfriends in, in this community? Everybody starts laughing. And then one person says, no, you, you know, it's not okay to have a boyfriend. You should focus on school. And someone else says, yeah, that's what the teacher says. But really, this is what we do. And so then you get a conversation. Mm -hmm. And so you're just sort of sitting back and listening. And every now and then asking questions. So you really under, try and understand how do people in this setting understand a particular issue. Yeah, so those are, those are some of the qualitative methods that mm -hmm. I used. Yeah. Great. And... I think you've clearly illuminated some of the, the benefits of those particular methods. In your experience and from your perspective, were there any downsides associated with any of those methods that you just shared with us? So one of the, with, if I take the example of focus group interviews, as you can imagine, they're great at getting at norms, but they're not necessarily great at getting at what's really going on. Right, because when people are in a group, there are things that they just won't admit, <laughs> that they will admit off, off uh, uh, when they're not in a group. So I would sometimes do focus group interviews, and then I would ask if individuals wanted to do individual interviews with me afterwards. And sometimes what was said in the group was clarified in the interview. So I, I heard a different story in an individual interview than I heard in a focus group. Or an example that someone said, you know, I had a friend who ha this happened to them. In the individual interview, I realized it was actually this person, you know, the person I'm interviewing to whom it happened. Um, and so, so sometimes, you know, what you're getting in focus groups is common sense or norms. But, but, but uh, what, what is missed is the sort of individual um, life experiences that people may not want to admit um, to to people. To, uh, in a, to, to their friends. Um, the, the other piece, too, was taping. Mm -hmm. um, 
Right, and so I taped all my interviews so I could transcribe them because it's always nice to have quotes that you can use or analyze. But there are a lot of things, again, people won't tell you on tape. Um, so, for example, um, I have a chapter on education, and uh, um, there was one interview I did um, with a uh, with a schoolgirl. Um, I think she was in her second year of high school, and she had been telling me about how in her school teachers would have relationships with students, and she she you know. But then once the tape turned off. Um, and then I often invited people to tell me, uh, you know, if, ask me questions, or uh, um, and 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 she told me, you know, actually this this was me, I was the person who you know who was approached by two different teachers, and then she described what happened, right? Because she knew I'd, I'd turned the tape off, uh, and I wasn't taking notes anymore, and so she felt free to um, uh, to, to to tell me what had really happened. Um, and so I think that was the other sort of constraint with, mm -hmm. with, with qualitative work is sometimes people don't want to talk on tape. Um, yeah, those are, those are some, at least some of the downsides. Mm -hmm. And so how long did it take you to do all that transcription? Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. Uh, a long time. How many years of your yeah. life? <laughs> yes. So that's the, the, pro the challenge with transcribing is it takes forever. <laughs> So for every one hour of an interview tape, it can take four to eight hours to actually like transcribe it, <laughs> if you're doing it yourself. <laughs> and then the challenge too is, is my interviews were in multiple languages. Um, and so at the time I was doing my field work, I learned um, Luo, the ethnic group language, which is sadly very rusty because I haven't spoken it since I was in the field. Um, Swahili, the national language, as well as English. And so interviews were often um, uh, in all three languages or in two languages and very rarely one language, right? And so someone would start off talking in English and then switch to Swahili, back to English, and then switch to Luo, back to English in the course of the interview. So transcribing was tricky, <laughs> right? Because you're not only sort of word for word translating, but you're also trying to unpack the meanings, right? Because I, I think... Uh, uh, and, and, and so um, I, I had a research assistant, um, and so she helped with some of the transcribing. I want to say I did about 60% of the transcribing. Um, but she was a Luo, and so I had mm -hmm. her transcribe the purely Luo interviews mm -hmm. because I wanted to make sure they were completely accurate. Sure. Then I was able to go over them uh, uh, again myself. Um, one thing I'd say, though, is it's worth transcribing your own interviews, even though it's a pain. <laughs> because you learn a lot mm -hmm. about even about yourself when you're transcribing. Mm -hmm. uh, so one of the things that I learned about myself when I was transcribing was how uh, my exclamations and how shocked I was, right? And so I, I, I remember my first focus group um, was in uh, Nyando, uh, Nyando, uh, which is one of the one of the districts in in in, um, in, in Nyanza province, um, and I was interviewing a group of girls. Uh, and, and every time they would say something, I'd be like, wow, oh my goodness, wow, <laughs> oh no, wow. <laughs> but I didn't realize I was doing this until I had myself back on the tape. <laughs> every other minute, I was like, wow, oh my goodness, wow, oh no, wow. And I was like, uh-oh, right? And it's not only a problem because I'm exclaiming, but it's also a problem because, you know, you can't judge. And the minute that people sense that you're reacting in some way, then they'll tailor their responses accordingly. And, and, and it became more important as my interviews progressed, especially when people are talking about sexual behavior, relationships that may be considered uh, immoral or wrong or that are often judged, and you want people to feel free to tell you what's, you know, what's going on in their everyday lives. So learning how to... Uh, censor myself and my reactions, mm -hmm. that was the quickest way to do it. <laughs> I need to stop exclaiming. But also, as you do the interviews, um, and, 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 and I imagine we'll get to this in a bit, but your own theories about what is going on start to emerge. Mm -hmm. um, so things you don't notice when you're asking questions, when you listen back to the tape, you, you start making connections. Like, huh, they said this, they said this. I, I wonder how that's connected. And so you make notes as you go along for things that you might ask in the next interview. 
or angles that you might pursue in the next interview. So it's actually part of the, the analysis process, transcribing it. So that's the way I try and make it a less um, unpleasant experience. But yeah. <laughs> Great. So I just want to open it up to the floor right now to see if anyone has any follow-up questions uh, to what we've already talked about or wanted to ask anything of Dr. Majola. Otherwise, I will keep going. Uh, yeah, and then in the back. So, so like, uh, when you were transcribing the, the different languages, w were, were you trying to, to really focus on more of the literal meaning, or were you trying very hard to, to paraphrase? Like, because it, uh, sometimes I, I see, like, like, if I'm trying to translate, I can't, I cannot go to the literal meaning because then it won't make sense. Mm -hmm. So, like, did you have to paraphrase for different audiences, yeah. or did you keep it the same? Yeah. Well, that's a really great question. Um, and it was especially um, important when someone else was transcribing. So I found myself going back to the tape to sort of see how, because um, this is the, the, the thing about translation, right, is it's, it's, it, you're, you're interpreting, you know, so you're, you're doing meaning making yourself. Uh, and sometimes the, 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 the angle you're taking or the, or the uh, the perspective that you have can shape how you choose to translate something. So me and my research assistant would sometimes go back and forth trying to figure out what someone really meant. So for example, um, in one setting, um, the, um, the, the, so you know, we're trying to figure out, you know, so girls in the set, so she was also a young Lua woman. So similar to the, the people that I was studying, she was just out of high school, really bright, um, you know, um, um, young woman. Um, and, uh, and so we went to one setting and the girls were, were sort of saying, you know, we're talking about how boys approach girls for relationships. Um, and, and so the girls had said something in the, in the, ta in the interview. And, and my research assistant disagreed and she didn't think that they were telling the truth. Uh, and the reason turned on uh, sort of uh, how, they, how they described the approach. And so she said that no young men in this setting would say that, I think it's, uh, if I recall, recall my lure correctly, like, adu adu like I, wa I want you, right? And so we're trying to figure out what does I want you mean? You know, is it I want you in a sexual sense? Is it I want you in a, in a relationship sense? Like, what does that really mean? Right, and so there are sort of alternative ways of, of, of figuring out what that means. Um, and so I would often, you know, do both, like so, sort of both the sort of literal translation and then potential paraphrases based on the context in which, um, in, in, in which the statements were made. So sort of trying to read the quote in the context of the interview as a whole, uh, and also the audience that, that, that people were speaking in. But it was, it was complicated, um, especially because I, ha I, I had to learn the language. So I wasn't also a native speaker. Um, and so I would often ask uh, if I wasn't sure. So for example, um, uh, the word to, to marry uh, is called, uh, it's, 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 it's tedo, which is like to cook. Uh, and so the, the gender differences, again, cor correct me if I'm wrong, I'm looking at uh, 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 Professor, uh, <laughs> who, can, who knows the language better than me. But um, to, 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 to do is to, to, to cook. And so someone would say a, a woman goes to cook for a man means that a woman is married you know, to a man. You know, so a, woman does, a man doesn't go to cook for a woman, mm. right? And so the way that that word is used, you know, and so the argument I was making in, in, in one of my papers was um, young men who are having relationships with women, but the women were the ones who were like, uh, uh, the ones who were considered to have married the man. So I had to really, you know, ask a lot of people uh, about the meaning of that particular word. Right? So depending on the argument that I was making in, in a particular part of either the book or papers, I would have to do more investigation to figure out. But it's a complicated one. That's a complicated question. Do you have a question? 
course. I, usually, every time I try to do qualitative stuff, it drains you emotionally. Yeah. And so I was just kind of, you know, doing so much of this. How did you cope with, and knowing that sometimes they're talk, talking about things that are horrible, mm -hmm. you know, that's why you go, oh my God. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Yeah. I, how do you go back and sleep? Yeah. So I'm just going to paraphrase into the microphone just in case it didn't get picked up. And so the, the question is asking you basically, um, knowing that qualitative work can be particularly draining, and especially given certain topics that it can be very emotionally draining, how, how do you cope with that? Oh, that's, a great, that's a great question. In fact, for me, the, the trying to learn how to emotionally cope started with the statistics. Hmm. Uh, and I think, and sort of, sort of the other piece to, to your earlier question that I didn't mention was, um, uh, I, I didn't believe the numbers. Mm -hmm. When I saw 30% infected, and at the time they weren't rolling out antiretroviral therapy, I, I, I couldn't get my head around it. So it's in fact, I talk about the, the density of death in the book because I was like, there, there must be a lot of death. You know, if these are the numbers, there must be a lot of death. And, and, and so even coping with the numbers was difficult. But then I went to the field and it was initially really much worse when I realized, you know, the reality of the taken for granted sense of people dying of, mm -hmm. of, of AIDS. Um, and I think after a while, I almost, well, for a while I got used to it, I was numb to it, until a certain point, and, and so, so as I was talk, talking earlier today, I, I couldn't interview anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, around, I think after about seven months, I couldn't do it anymore. And in fact, I, 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 I haven't been able to return back in a research capacity because it just became too difficult emotionally. Um, you know, I did, especially the, the interviews with the HIV positive teenage girls were just heartbreaking. They were heartbreaking. You know, especially girls, you know, a lot of um, young women get HIV through everyday relationships, right? I think that the stereotype is it's a, the really promiscuous girls who've had lots of partners, but in fact, just one partner, long term, is risky. You know, especially in settings where the, the prevalence rate is high. So just to, to give you an example, if you live in a setting where one in five people are positive, right? And then imagine you go to a party, one in five people are positive, right? When you meet someone, you're not thinking, let's do an HIV test. <laughs> you're thinking, oh, they look nice, let's go out, right? And even in the States context, right? You hook up the next morning, oh, maybe they had an STI, <laughs> oh, whatever you have, I have, right? And, and, and so the whole sort of script of going for testing is not part of the how people get together script, you know, and even more in this setting. And so if you can imagine, you know, everyday relationships where, you know, most people don't have HIV, so even with a context where 20% are positive, 80% are not positive. Right? So most people don't have HIV. But there are enough people who do that a simple choice of a boyfriend in, um, is, is, is risky. And, and just to, to, to make it even more um, clear, the likelihood of getting HIV is about one in a thousand per time that someone has sex. So the one night stand is actually very low risk. So it's not the, the, the one night stands, but the long term relationship where there's repeated exposure to HIV. So it's the girl who has a boyfriend for six months or a year who's most at risk, mm -hmm. not the girl who has the one night stand, right? And so that's what I mean by the everyday relationship, right? So, so in the case of the, the, this one girl, I'll just never forget, she was 16, and she got HIV from her boyfriend, right? Uh, and, and it was just, you know, um, and they're just, at the time I interviewed her, they had just started rolling out antiretroviral therapy. So in her case, and she had access to it. So in her case, you know, at least I knew she's not going to die because she doesn't have access to medicine. But I did know that she's going to be on this for the rest of her life, this side of a cure. And what kind of life 
you know, because even living with HIV is difficult, even with medication. You know, it's really difficult. And so it was just, it was really heartbreaking. Um, but I, I, I find that I'm able to work on HIV AIDS because like, I'm not there all the time. Every now and then I have my breakdowns, <laughs> I have my, you know, I can't do this anymore moments. But most of the time I find it interesting. And that's what helps, that I'm able to not always be emotionally involved. So there are topics that I can't work on, like intimate partner violence, that I have, you know, my colleagues can work on. But for me, I, I just can't. But HIV AIDS, I, I can work on. Um, and not always be uh, completely upset. Mm. But, you know, as I said, I haven't, been, I haven't followed up, for example. Um, I, I, I can't, I, 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 yeah, I, I don't think I can. I don't really want to know mm. what happened. Um, uh, because it was just, it got to be too much. Yeah, there was just, you know, now I'll just, you know, finish with this, but I remember when, especially when I first arrived, started noticing, um, you know, one town I, I visited, Bondo, um, the, you know, class, you know, you sort of see an advertisement for classic coffins. Um, there are more coffins than sofas in the, in the carpentry shop. And then you move further down, you see another branch of, you know, classic coffins, you're like, you know, okay. And then you, you know, hear stories of a grandmother who has lost all her children and is taking care of 11 orphans. You go to another community, you hear the same story. You visit someone else and they've taken in. It just got, got too much, you know? Got too much. And so uh, it was, I think it was a reason why I couldn't do any more interviews after a while. Yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. Oh, yeah, because I know it. Uh it, it can get so deep that you give up before you get to yeah. where you really want to be. Yeah. You know, so I mean, with that time maybe you reached a saturation point in yeah. terms of data collection. Yes. But you could have given up before that just because yeah. I, I started a study that I gave up because I couldn't deal with mm -hmm. the crying. Yeah. And now you're dealing with the dying. Yeah, no, I was fortunate that I'd reached it. I'd reached data saturation on most of the questions I was interested in. So I was able to stop. Yeah. Before you start, another question. Do you mind just lifting the other microphone? Okay. Did you have a question in the back or? No? Okay. So thank you both of you for those questions. And I, and I think what I appreciate about that last question is that it, illuminates um, your humanity. So there are oftentimes, um, it, it seems that when we talk about research um, and we talk about um, scientific research and the, you know, the supposed objectivity, right, that particularly in, in quantitative methodologies, that somehow suggests that um, we're stripped of our humanity when we do the research that we do. Um, both quantitatively and qualitatively. I thought it was actually very interesting uh, to hear you say and confirm some of my own experiences that it was the, the quantitative research that initially just hit you so emotionally. And, and I think there's a way in which um, we divide quantitative and qualitative and imbue qualitative inquiry with much more humanity than um, qualitative, and certainly we understand um, the backdrop of that, but I, but I think we bring our humanity to all the research that we do. So I, I appreciate you talking about that and, and responding to that question about your own emotional engagement in your work, which then sort of leads me um, to this next question about how you, um, as an individual and a human being um, that also happens to be a researcher, how you are situated in your own inquiry. So you yourself are Kenyan, mm -hmm. and um, you talk about in the book that this provides you with some degree of insider knowledge, which you've already alluded to somewhat, but you also talk about yourself as simultaneously being an anomaly, as an unmarried, mm -hmm. childless woman pursuing a PhD in America, mm -hmm. right? And that, um, you know, to quote you, that you were simultaneously dealing with this tension between 
belonging yet not quite belonging and understanding yet not quite understanding. And so I think you occupy a unique position in where you can really speak to us about the relative advantages of insider knowledge and, and what that meant to you in uh, the research process. And if you think perhaps there are any ways, um, both positive and negative, however we want to talk about it, ways in which that may have affected, let's say, your your face-to-face -face interviews, where people might be more willing to disclose certain types of things because of you, mm -hmm. or less willing to do so because of you and, and who you are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it, I, I think, to, to, to start, I think one reason why I got access to schools, I went to, um, I, I uh, attempted um, to interview at 15 schools and 14 schools allowed me to interview, which is a sort of shockingly high, you know, agreement or acceptance rate, especially since I went, you know, cold turkey. You know, I went, mm -hmm. because I was traveling to um, so many parts of the province, um, I didn't have time to go back to a school. And so I would arrive at a school, ask for permission, and then if they gave me permission, I would do interviews that day wow. at that school in that location. So the fact that 14 schools agreed, I think was partly because uh, I was Kenyan, mm -hmm. um, and partly because I think a lot of the, uh, the teachers wanted their students to see somebody like me, right? So I was sort of seen as a role model uh, for their students. Like here's an example of a young woman who is you know, finish school, uh, and, and we want our students to, to engage with that. So I think it really helped with the access. Um, and in the context of the interviews, too, um, because I had my own memories of going to school, there were certain uh, uh, things that I understood mm -hmm. um, in, 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 in what they were saying, how they were explaining. Um, but at, at the same time, it was also clear that I had very different um, I had to learn the language, for one. Um, I was in a you know, different economic situation than them. Um, and, you know, I'd come from a family background where you know, I didn't have to worry about things like money for um, sanitary towels, which a lot of the, the girls didn't, you know, their parents didn't consider those needs. Um, and I never had to worry about that. So there were basic economic circumstances that were very different between the girls I was interviewing. And, and so there were parts that I didn't understand, like how really you know, feeling like something was a need would lead a girl to have a relationship with someone who would help to provide, to provide those things. Mm -hmm. And then also just the everyday life um, of the Luo. My grandmother is a, is a Luo, so she's from the same ethnic group. Okay. But I didn't learn her language until I started doing my field work or just before I, I started doing my field work. So it's not just about the language, but the world view. You know, that this sort of comes bundled with a language mm -hmm. that I had to learn. Mm. Um, you know, so, 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 so that was also a challenge. Sure. You know, what are, what are the ways of life, or what are the common sense understandings of this people group? Mm -hmm. You know, how do they see the world? And, 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 and the language is a sort of important way of, 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 of getting at that. So that was really difficult. Interesting. That was really difficult. Um, uh, yeah. Great. Thank you. So can you talk a little bit now about, from your own perspective and fr from doing this work, what you think the unique strengths are of uh, mixing methods, mm -hmm. of, of employing and relying on survey work while also um, bringing to bear uh, more qualitative oriented methods? Um, I think that the thing I like about mixed methods or mul multiple methods is that the freedom it gives you to fully pursue a research question. Um, so in my case, in not having a methodological barrier, I'll only do quantitative work or I'll only do qualitative work, allowed me to follow wherever the, the leads were. So if something occurred in my qualitative work and I was like, is this demographically true? Mm -hmm. Then I could go back to the survey and check. Or if I found something in the survey, I could say, is this actually, you know, what, what, what is the logic underlying this? You know, so when I looked at um, 
young women's HIV rates and young men's HIV rates in this setting, I could see that young men had almost no HIV, age 15 to 19. So I could go to interviews and, and try and figure out why, does this mean that you know, young men have no relationships? <laughs> right. In this I could ask them. And so I think there's, there's a lot of freedom that being able to use multiple methods allows. Um, but it's also really difficult. Um, I, I, you know, I, do, I definitely want to emphasize how difficult it can be to learn different methods well. So learning statistics takes a lot of time, um, a lot of tears and fall. <laughs> you know, um, it, 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 it's, it's not easy. Statistics is not, you have to put in the time, you have to put in the hours to get really good at, at, at statistical work. Um, and the same with qualitative work, doing, you know, learning how to do interviews takes time. Learning how to do them well takes time. Um, learning how to make people comfortable, sharing, you know, intimate details of their lives um, takes time. Um, and, and, and so I think it, it required, on my part, a great deal of patience with myself to learn the different methods well uh, and to learn the different literatures well mm -hmm. as, as well. Also took a lot of time. So I think mixed methods work takes longer. Yeah. <laughs> I will support that. <laughs> so you spoke of literatures, plural. And so we've talked um, predominantly so far about uh, mixed methods, but I, I want to sort of widen the, the lens, if you will, right, to talk about the fact that you've clearly employed an interdisciplinary or at least multidisciplinary methodology and approach to your work. And I'm wondering how that, that came about for you, right? So as I alluded to, um, and as I see in your work, I mean, it's one of the best examples in a very long time from my perspective of a, of a truly interdisciplinary uh, approach to a research question. Um, I was pretty impressed and floored by all the streams that you were able to thread together, whether it was you know, the epi data, which for me, because I'm in public health, I was like, yay, data. But also, you know, seeing that sort of larger cultural critique of modernism within the context of Kenya and consumption. And I, so you drew on so many literatures. And I'm wondering if you can, to the extent that, you know, you are conscious of even doing that, if you can and talk about that approach to your work and if that came from your training or if that if there was a particular aha moment or just what that process is like for you drawing on all those literatures. I, I've, I've found that it's somewhat unfortunately or unfortunately how I tend to think. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's unfortunate because it takes so long. Um, it, it really takes a long time to learn enough about a field to talk about it in a way that people who focus on that field are happy with. Mm. So uh, the, the, the last substantive chapter of the book, I go into environmental sociology. So I found myself studying uh, fish, ecology, <laughs> the quality of water, because it's dominated by Lake Victoria. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of pollution uh, in Lake Victoria that I found was affecting the fishing industry in ways that had an impact on, on HIV risk. Um, and so, again, mm -hmm. it was sort of pursuing the question. Like, I really wanted to know whether this was a factor. Mm -hmm. But to, in order to find that out, I had to be willing to figure out, you know, so I, I looked at basic undergraduate textbooks mm -hmm. on ecology and wetlands ecology. Uh, you know, I had to learn what wetlands are because it had been a while since I took <coughs> geography in high school. Um, <laughs> You know, and then moving up now to be able to read some of the academic literature in, in, in that field. Um, but I think it's, it's just always the way that I've, 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 I look at topics. So even my current project in Washington, D.C. is mm -hmm. going to be similar, unfortunately. Because <laughs> again, in, I'm, I have to look at multiple fields because I think in, I'm really trying to understand how a society works. And the society isn't split by discipline. Right. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's not. You know, and, and so that means I have to study all the aspects that help me understand what, what's going on. 
you know, a, you know, for a particular disease. Uh, and so the particular mix of topics is going to vary from setting to setting, okay. like what ends up being relevant. Sure. And I've been fortunate to have both um, a committee uh, and colleagues who are willing to let me take the time I need mm -hmm. <laughs> to figure to figure things out. Um, yeah. It's, so so it's so it wasn't intentional. I didn't intend to be interdisciplinary. Okay. <laughs> it, it was simply, uh, at least in my mind, necessary. I wasn't going to really find out what was going on unless I was willing to. So in the in the fishing case, I'd begun my interviews with an icebreaker. You know, it's, it's it, you can't go into a community and say, so how many partner sexual partners did you have in the last twelve months? Right. <laughs> <laughs> to strangers. Right? So, so I used to start by saying, what are some of the issues that are important in, in your community? What are the big issues? And so many people would say that the lake is now polluted. It hmm. used to be clean, and now it's green. You know, and, and, and so a lot of people brought up lake pollution. And then we went on to other topics. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of people brought up fishermen. Um, fishermen are playing a role in HIV risk. Um, and then when I talked to fishermen, a lot of fishermen talked about having to migrate further in search of fish because the fish were moving. Right. So when I came back from the field, I started putting these pieces together. So first I, I wanted to see how much pollution is actually in the lake, and I found that it was substantial. Mm. And then I looked at the fish literature and found that, yes, you know, fish you know, uh, catch sizes have actually decreased. The supply of fish has decreased. The fish breeding grounds have been destroyed. So then I looked at, um, um, you know, started putting it together and with the qualitative accounts, I'm like, okay, so there's pollution. Pollution drives the fish further out. Fishermen have to migrate further in search of fish. They don't have fridges, so they have to land on new beaches. And because of the gendered economy, women uh, sell fish, men fish, mm. they had to find new women to sell their fish. So you could sort of see how HIV would spread around the lake communities because of changes in the, in the environment around the lake, right? And so I had to, I, I didn't see a way to not look at those literatures to figure out what was really going on. Yeah. So, so it's, it just took a long time. <laughs> Yes, and I finally, you know, <laughs> was able to figure figure out what was going. On. Well, this then leads me to my next question, though. How did you know you were done? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when when I felt like I had um, when I when I when the story made sense. Okay. When I felt like it it, it actually it actually made sense. So I had, I felt like all the pieces, so, so for me, what makes research exciting is it's, it's sort of like a detective, uh, you know, for, for me, I'm always pursuing a, 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 a line or a thread, right? So I start with a problem, mm -hmm. and it's always an interesting puzzle. And so I start in one place, and then I just keep following the leads. So even landing on the issue of money came about halfway through fieldwork. Oh, wow. So first it was, relationships, you know. Mm -hmm. Older men have more sexual experience, you know, young men give us stress, <laughs> you know. So I was like, what, why older men? Why older men? And then money started coming up. So then I started doing a lot of questions on money. Mm -hmm. And then when I reached saturation there, I started, f you know, finding new leads and then started pursuing that, right? And so you sort of, I sort of keep going until I feel like I have a satisfying story. Okay. To tell. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, so I think the same with the fishing. I'm like, okay, yeah. I think I finally figured out, you know, this, is, this must have been how it's initially spread around the lake. You know, this, this must have been the mechanism through which it happened. Sure. So. Yeah. The, the changing, yes, ecological and economic mm -hmm. patterns. Absolutely. Uh, other questions for Dr. Majola? About your um, interdisciplinary approach, how did you know when, like, an outside topic came up? How how did you know that that was important enough to follow through on? And then how did you know, as you said, you need to know enough about the subject to be able to communicate about it with 
other people who are actually in that field, how did you know when you knew enough for that? How did, how did you learn enough about things that you didn't think were pertaining to your research question before you started? Yeah. Well, at the time, when, when I was interviewing, I have to admit, when people kept bringing up lake pollution, in my mind, I was thinking, this, has, this is not important. <laughs> but it's a good icebreaker because everybody's talking about it. So I sort of set it aside and followed, like, you know, so when I interview, it, I start with what people are interested in first, you know, to, 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 so that we develop a rapport and get com comfortable. Um, and then as the interview progresses, I'll slowly, so I have my interview schedule, but once I'm familiar enough with it, uh, then I just start slowly guiding the interview to sort of the questions or areas that I'm interested in so that it's not so such an abrupt transition. So they start with the lake and then we move to livelihoods. You know, so how do people earn a living in this area other than fishing? And then from there we move to, you know, are there differences? You know, how do women earn a living? Is that different from men? And then we move to what are the challenges that women have? You know, and then what about relations? So there's some kind of logical pattern based on what people start with. Um, talking about in, 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 in the interviews. Um, and so in the course of the interview, I only know what I think is important. And so this is where the key informant interviews are helpful. So that I know, you know, these are the things that should, you know, important based on local experts. And then the interview, uh, I have my own concerns in addition to the ones that the key informants raise. But then I just interview um, and, and oftentimes it's when I start to see it repeated in multiple interviews that I start to realize that something is important. So the first interview I can, you know, that's just a side issue. The second time people mention it, I'm like, hmm. The third time people mention it, I'm like, okay, this is an issue I need to pursue. So then I start seeing if it's an, I ask, start asking it as a new question that comes up in every subsequent interview. Uh, and, 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 and other questions where I feel like I know what people are going to say, so I've reached saturation, I ask just for confirmation, but I don't follow up so much because I'm like, I think I have a handle on that answer. But I usually wait to see it repeated in interviews as, as one way of knowing this is something I need to pursue more. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. My question was just how did you know how deeply you needed to like do your own research about yeah. say like fisheries like how did yeah. you know you know was it was it when their answers started to make sense or did you have to do a lot of outside research and talk to a lot of like experts um, like who would have that ecological perspective and then did you go back and do um, like more research about that specifically so the, the fishing piece came up during coding. Mm -hmm. So when I, when I was reading through my transcripts afterwards, and I started seeing oh, there are a lot of transcripts that mention you know, the lake. And there are a lot of transcripts that mention fishermen. And then are there patterns in, in what people are saying about fishermen? Or are there patterns in what people are saying about the lake? And then it was actually curiosity that made me think, let me look into the ecological literature. I mean, Lake Victoria is the largest freshwater lake in Africa, the second largest in the world. Uh, so it's a major sort of um, lake that people who are you know, ecologists study. Mm -hmm. So I figured that there must be some literature um, about Lake Victoria that I can look up just, just to see. You know? And so when I started looking first, OK, I don't understand. I, I need to look at some basic textbooks. <laughs> you know, to understand the, the, the language. But then I was like, oh my goodness, there's significant pollution in the lake. So then I started thinking, okay, I need to pursue this a, a, a bit further. So that happened like w when I left the field. Mm. Yeah, I hadn't, uh, it wasn't something I want to, you know, look for because I'm not an environmental sociologist. <laughs> um, you know, it was not at all what I planned. And a lot of that came afterwards. Um, when I, when I was figuring out like what is going to be in the book, what isn't going to be in the book, and so the fishing stuff was like, felt like an aside. Mm. This will be a side paper uh, that won't be in the book because what does the lake have to do with why young women have high rates of HIV? And so that's, so it became this sort of detective 
okay, there is pollution. Does it have an effect on fish? So then I look in the fish literature, I'm like, yes, it does. <laughs> and then, you know, what effect is it having on the fish? You know, and, you know, the different kinds of fish in the lake. And then putting it together with the interview accounts of the fishermen and their migration patterns. Um, and, and so that's how the story started coming together. Yeah, after, well after I left the field. Other questions? Diana? I'm always interested in, <coughs> I'm always interested in hearing about pe how people think about the ethics mm -hmm. of research. Mm -hmm. And I can imagine that given the kind of research that you do, mm -hmm. there's several layers of this, yes. right? Yes. Partly that has to do with simply the, the ethics of, of um, your relations with your informants, mm -hmm. you know, with the people to um, sort of the bigger picture, why do this and how do I want this to have an impact and that sort of thing. I'm just wondering if, if you would have anything to say about any of mm -hmm. these layers yeah. of ethical questions. Yeah. It's a really important question, also a difficult one. Um, it was very hard to get my research approved um, because it's every, every kind of vulnerable population you can think of. <laughs> HIV AIDS, young people, some of them are orphans, uh, international setting. Um, so there were so many issues and as it turned out, it was because I had um, an anthropologist on the IRB who was able to argue this is really important research. So then there's a lot of back and forth to sort of figure out what is a good way to ensure that you know, these young women's voices are heard um, but at the same time that they're protected, because I think it is important that they're protected. Um, I, and I think that's critical. So I really believed, I think what helped me get through the back and forths with the IRB was I really appreciated what they were doing. You know, and I was really glad that someone was asking me the hard questions, because I think someone has to. And, and I encountered, you know, there were, you know a lot of orphans, a lot of... Um, a lot of girls uh, uh, with no parents, uh, you know, guardians, and so so. What what I ended up doing was, um, uh, it seems that the schools act in loco parentis, and so the permission letters for the school would would sort of uh, be sufficient for um, instead of indiv you know, asking individual parents. Um, that, that, and I asked a lot of key informants in Kenya, what was the appropriate, um, so in addition to the IRB here, I also asked the locals, what, is, what, what should I be doing? What are the steps I should be taking? Um, and that, that ended up being really helpful. Um, I also went to all the district officials in every district, so I went to the district commissioner, the district education officer, um, the district health officer, um, in some cases also the district information officer for all the places that I study to tell them about my research, to get their letters of permission. Um, and then, then also just for them to be aware of what I, what I was doing. Um, and then in addition to the Ministry of, of, of Education as well. And that probably also helped with access. The fact mm -hmm. that I had you know, all these letters of mm -hmm. um, uh, permission or approval from all the officials, but they also gave really interesting perspectives on what was going on. Um, so, for example, the teach with the teachers, I, I first figure found out that a lot of teachers were dying of HIV/AIDS from the district education officers because they were concerned because the government had put a freeze on hiring new teachers, and so they found that a lot of schools were losing teachers and they weren't able to replace them. And so then you go to the schools and students are telling you about relationships with teachers and then you, again, you come back from the field and, and you, you start putting, uh, putting pieces together. So, and that was also challenging because you know, I, I remember in one setting where the student had even told the principal and the principal hadn't fired the teacher. And then you're sort of like, well, what do, what do I do in this, in this situation? Um, so there were a lot of tricky situations like that where I wasn't entirely clear what what I was supposed to what I was supposed to do um, in 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 that setting. But 
But it's something I, I thought about a lot uh, in, the, in the context of field work. Um, yeah. Does that, does that answer your question? I guess part of, yes, it does. But I'm also wondering if you, if for you, the question of ethics also came into how you wrote the book mm -hmm. and what you hope the book will do yeah. in the world. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, well, I, I mean, one reason why it, it took me a while to write the book to transform it from a dissertation into a book. Uh, and part of that was you know, losing the dissertation committee baggage, <laughs> all the things you add you know, for your committee, uh, figuring out what the real argument I was making was, because I think there's a lot of apologizing or covering oneself in a <laughs> dissertation. I've read everything on this topic and everything, and I suggest this and I suggest that. Uh, so it took me a while to figure out what I was really arguing. Mm -hmm. But I also wanted to have a policy chapter. And it took me a while to figure out, so what do we do about it? And, and so I think for me, that was the biggest sort of ethical challenge in, as far as writing the book was concerned, was I'd, I felt like I'd, okay, I've described the problem well, but so what? Mm -hmm. You know, so what? Especially when you, you know, one is writing about a topic like HIV AIDS, where you know, people are dying. Um, I, I wanted to have a policy chapter. And I didn't think that I, I, I wanted to wait until I had actually written the chapter before starting to talk about it. You know, I wanted to go back having something to say, as opposed to just, here's a good description of the problem of, of, of HIV AIDS. But since the book was published, I, I guess I haven't done as much as I should. Um, going, back, um, going back to Kenya this December, uh, and so I'll be giving a, a, a talk on the book. But in terms of actually giving policymakers, here are the things that you should do, is what I haven't done um, at this point. Um, I s I've sent the book to the, big, the, the, the sort of big foundations who fund the, the programs for um, young women, HIV AIDS. Now, how, f how far that has gone, I don't know. So I sent it to the Population Council and, 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 and so on. You know, all the people who I know send millions of dollars yeah. to programs. Um, and also, um, s I've sent my work to practitioners, people who work with orphans. Um, uh, but I think I could probably do more in terms of doing a sort of policy friendly. I think it's even the people at USAID in Washington DC have a, have a copy of the book who also send. So I've done that. But I think it more in terms of, you know, the one sheet, five bullet points <laughs> <laughs> kind of deal that a, the policymaker would really do. Um, yeah, I think my, 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 excuse, my only excuse <laughs> would be I just got tenure. <laughs> So I'm just, so I'm just coming out of the. I don't have to be fully focused on 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 keeping my job. I can now start <laughs> thinking about how do I make sure this is not just a book that gathers dust and actually is is of use to people in the field. Um, and so I'm hoping to do something in Nyanza Province at some point. Um, I've been talking about it on and off. Um, um, uh, with, 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 with folks in Kenya about having some kind of thing where I, I can talk about what I found. Um, but that's what, I, yeah, that's, so that's sort of what's been on my mind more recently is, okay, I've sent it to the people who send a lot of money uh, on programs with young women, but how much effect that will have, I don't know. Um, and I've sent it to a few practitioners, um, but are now, I, you know, I need to see if I can actually say talk to teachers and, pr and principals, people like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I think it's, but, but for me, the, when I think about the ethics, that's part of what comes up for me with the ethics is, is you know, is it, is, it, is it conscionable to just write a book and assume, you know, assume without making at least some kind of effort to make sure the people who would most benefit from it actually know what I found. So...
Well, I noticed recently that um, President Obama announced a new initiative mm -hmm. to address girls and young women in Sub-Saharan Africa mm -hmm. um, regarding HIV AIDS mm -hmm. transmission. And stuff. I should send so I am wondering whether you <laughs> read your book. I do. You know? I do. <laughs> Maybe it's already had an effect. Maybe it's already had an effect. But but I, but I think it's it's something that sometimes within the framework of academia is not always supported. So in fact, my um, I think it was earlier this year there was an article in the New York Times about young women uh, and HIV/AIDS, and the editor of my book uh, wrote me to ask, could you, could I write an op-ed? And I was thinking, you know, to respond, and I was uh, thinking, the Board of Regents are about to vote. <laughs> On my tenure case, I don't think I want to make national press <laughs> right now because there's sometimes a lot of pushback, you know, when you're writing on issues around HIV AIDS, especially if you're going against the grain or, or the convention. In this case, it was an um, article on treatment as prevention. They found that a lot of programs had failed among young women in Africa. And I'm like, I think I can tell you why the programs have failed. But I'm like, I don't know if I want to, at, at this point, so this, I think this was February or March. I think at that point my case was, you know, mm -hmm. and so I was thinking about, uh, I don't want to get into trouble uh, and, sink, and sink my case, but after I told my, my editor, after I get tenure, then I can, I can start thinking about writing op-eds. And so this is kind of the, the, the year where I'm, where I'm trying to think about what comes next in, in, in my career and what kinds of freedoms I have now that I'm not worried about. <laughs> yes, getting tenure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the realities of academic life. Yeah. Other questions? So, um, well, we can go in one of two, two directions here. Um, I'm curious if you want to speak at all about the new project mm -hmm. and how that's going and um, perhaps what similarities and differences you're finding, given the different cultural, geographic, national contexts in which you're doing the current work? Okay. Yeah. Um, so my current project, I'm looking at the epidemic in Washington, DC. Um, and in 2011, I had a sort of small pot of research money that was use it or lose it. And I read an article, um, I guess this would be the last, uh, I read an article in the Washington Post that said 3% of Washington, D.C. residents are HIV positive. Um, African Americans was, was particularly affected. So 4% of African Americans were positive. Um, and even higher uh, proportions of African American men were HIV positive. And the rates were so shocking to me in the U.S. Um, in a city that had sent $15 billion to Africa for antiretroviral therapy. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what sent me to the field, was I have to figure out what's going on. Right. Um, and so it started off as a small summer project, but it's turning into a much larger project about um, racial health disparities more broadly. Um, so in the US, um, blacks have higher rates of illness and death, mm -hmm. and those dispar relative to whites, and those disparities have persisted for several decades um, and so HIV AIDS is just one of many diseases that uh, affect African Americans disproportionately. Uh, and so what I'm doing is I'm trying to understand above and beyond individual risk, mm -hmm. what are some of the social processes, um, structural processes that have made African Americans vulnerable to disease? So in a similar way to the book, it's very interdisciplinary. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at migration to the city, mm including okay. the migration from the South, mm -hmm. racial residential segregation, mass incarceration, um, uh, the war on drugs, mm -hmm. different drug epidemics, the politics of the city, so the federal ban on needle exchange mm -hmm. programs. Sure. So those are all policing mm -hmm. um, in, in Washington, D.C. neighborhoods. So those are all playing a role. Wow. In, 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 and so it's a complicated project, and, and it's going to be interdisciplinary. Um, but that's what I'm doing this year on my sabbatical is I'm trying to figure out how did it come to be that this group of people, especially vulnerable, mm 
in a city that has the most financial thinking here about the capital right. Congress, mm -hmm. the most ability to bring this to an end. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's the puzzle I'm trying to grapple with. So it's also very distressing. Because I was like, this should not be happening in, Ameri in, in America. Right. It sh should not be happening in America. So that's my new project. Yeah. And have <laughs> you, so have you started the, the field work on that yet, or you're just no. in the process of? Uh, field work is done. It's done. I did, I did the field work wow. in 2011. It took me four years to, I'm finally ready to, okay. to write it. Um, so yeah, it's all done. I'm just writing wow. this year. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. exciting. Yeah. I am quite sure that we will look forward to the results of that project. Um, so I think we're going to wrap up, but I would like to sort of wrap up on a more general note mm -hmm. about research and the research process and give you the opportunity to either share with us uh, the best advice you have ever gotten in terms of um, your research and your scholarship mm -hmm. and or um, if there's any advice that you would like to share with students about uh, yeah. the research process. Yeah, um, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, I think you have to pick a topic that you find fascinating. Mm -hmm. I think it has to it has to engage you uh, above and beyond an assignment that you have to finish. Because what I've found, especially if you're going into academia, is you're going to live with that topic for a really long time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I did the field work for this in you know 2006. Mm -hmm. You know, so this is like almost 10 years later. I'm still talking about it, mm -hmm. and you know, still interested in it. But <laughs> but uh, so that's that's one thing is you know pick something that you find really interesting. And I think it also helps if you, care, you really care about it um, in, in, in some capacity or you feel that it matters mm -hmm. in some way. Um, I would also say, at least for me, my uh, colleagues have often called me a high-risk, high-reward scholar because I was willing to take time mm -hmm. to figure things out as opposed to rushing to publish, publish, publish. Mm -hmm. And so... I took a really long time before my first paper started coming out. Like the fishing paper was the first paper that came out when I was on the tenure track. <laughs> and I just explained how long it took to get that paper written. But um, I think for me, I've had to learn to be patient. Mm. I think with myself and with my way of working, that I'm a slow scholar and that's okay. Um, and just to follow my heart in terms of what I want to work on, you know, as opposed to working on something that someone else wants me to work on. Mm -hmm. um, I think those are, the, those are the two things I would say, <coughs> is pick something that really interests you and that you care about, and then have, have patience, because it's, it's not a quick, it's a very much a delayed gratification <laughs> sort of process. Very delayed, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Like graveside. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So it requires, I think, a lot of perseverance. Um, and I think that it's hard in this culture to, uh, with a sort of, we're used to texting and everything happening quickly, to have the patience with something that will take years. So, but yeah. I think it's worth it. I think it's worth it. Um, I think it's worth uh some things are worth taking time over. Yeah, you have a question. Um, basically, what was the hardest part of like writing this book? Was it learning all the information, knowing that so many people are out there having this problem, have HIV, or was it like interviewing the girls, listening to their stories, mm -hmm. and having them talk about how they got it? Yeah. That's a great question. Every, every stage had its challenges. Um, getting my dissertation proposal passed through my committee was traumatic. <laughs> that was really difficult. Um, my first entry into the field was very difficult. Just getting getting used to um, uh, getting used to the field site and the challenges of, of the folks that I was studying was really difficult. Coming back to the U.S. was also difficult. Mm -hmm. there, was a, there was definitely an adjustment period that was needed. Um, and writing is difficult. <laughs> it really is, and I don't. I, I think that it took me a long time to realize that part of what one is learning to do, especially in a doctoral program, is to become a writer. Like what we're, you know, a lot of what we're doing is writing. You know, it's either teaching or writing. 
you know, and at, at the end of the day, that's what we're doing. And, and it's hard to write. Like, I haven't met anybody who says it's easy. You know, and, and so learning how to be disciplined about writing, you know, writing every day or writing every other day, but just writing, that was difficult. Um, and, and learning how to, like, keep going and, 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 and doing a little every day. Um, I would say that was the hardest, you know, was just getting, getting myself into the discipline of writing, writing, mm -hmm. writing every day. Um, because it's, it, it didn't come naturally mm -hmm. to me. And then writing in a readable way, too. I wanted to write a readable book. Um, that was also not, you know, challenging. Because I think a, a lot of academic uh, writing allows you to hide, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, behind lots of names, lots of authors. Um, and so, yeah, so, so, so I would say that every stage had, had its challenges. Um, the, the final piece was just what are, what are people going to think? Mm. I think it's, a book is scary in a way a paper is not scary because you feel very exposed. That's interesting. Um, and so there's a long period of silence. I was like, I don't know what people think about the book. Do they hate it? Is it a good book? Is it a bad book? Um, so that was really scary, I think, was not knowing what people would think about it. Okay, but I think we can say that they like it yes. because you received an award, right? One of the, the best books on gender and sexuality studies from the American Sociological Association. Did I get that right? It's the best book of scientific literature. There you go. Yeah. So, they like it. I think they like it. I think they like you. Thank you. Thank well, I'm going to wrap up. No, did you have a question? Where did the focus? Yeah. Is, ah, this is the best we've seen. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. I'm tr I'm trying to remember the letter that um, uh, the email that the the chair of the committee sent. One of the pieces actually she mentioned was the interdisciplinary piece. Um, they thought it was well written, um, which I was like, okay, good. You know, people can <laughs> people can read it. Um, they thought it was really interdisciplinary. Um, uh, we were reaching into lots of different fields. Um, they liked the analysis um, as well. Those are, those are the things that I remember from the letter. I think she said a lot more, but those are the things that I remember, um, especially just based on what you, wh what you said reminded me of what she said in that letter, was I engaged uh, people in a lot of fields who would otherwise not be talking to each other. Yeah, so I think that's what she said. Thank you. Well, yes, thank you, Dr. Majola, for, um, well, for your work, but for also taking the time to just have a conversation with us about the process um, of research, the process of writing, um, and what it means to engage in multi-method inquiry, and the challenges and the benefits of, of doing the work that you do. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.